Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, uh, Overview of Violence Against Women Reauthorization Act of 2013, otherwise known as VAWA 2013. My name is Matt Leslie, and I'm with the Technical Assistance Collaborative and will be one of the facilitators for today. Next slide. Before we dive into today's presentations, just some quick housekeeping items to review. The session is being recorded and the recording and materials will be available on the HUD Exchange. And I'll drop this link in the chat in a bit. The session is being recorded. Oh, please note that all participants are muted, but you will be able to submit questions at any point in time throughout the presentations in the Q&A box. You can also use the chat feature at the bottom right to introduce who you are, organization name, and where you are located. You can share thoughts or comments also in the chat, but for specific questions on items in the presentation, just make sure to put those questions in the Q&A box. We will try and answer all of your questions, but if we don't have an answer today, we'll make sure to reach out to you directly and or share that on the HUD Exchange. Unfortunately, we will not be able to answer questions on VAWA 2022 because that is still in the rulemaking process. Next slide. Joining me today, we have the Deputy Director of the Office of HIV Housing, um, HIV AIDS Housing at HUD, Amy Paolonis. We also have Kate Burdell and Jill Robertson with the Office of HIV AIDS Housing. And lastly, we also have Janice Miller, who is a fellow colleague of mine at the Te Technical Assistance Collaborative. I am going to pass it over to Amy for a brief introduction before we move on with the webinar. Thanks, Matt. Um, and thanks to TAC for hosting this webinar um, today. And um, thanks to all the uh, participants for joining today's webinar on VAWA requirements for the HOPL program. The purpose of today's webinar is to provide an overview of existing regulatory requirements related to protections for um, survivors of domestic violence, dating violence, sexual assault, and stalking. For those of you who have been implementing local HOPL programs for a while, this should be a refresher. Um, and for the newer folks, it may be your first time hearing some of this information. It is critically important that grantees and project sponsors understand the VAWA requirements and protections available um, to ensure that individuals and families um, served by the HOPL program can remain safe and stably housed. If you have any questions at all, please don't hesitate to ask. Um, and if you think you would benefit from more in-depth technical assistance on VAWA, please submit that request through the HUD exchange. Before I turn things back over to Matt, I just wanna say thank you for all of your um, hard work to meet the housing needs of low-income people with HIV and their families. We really appreciate all that you do. Um, thanks and back to you, Matt. Thanks, Amy. Uh, next slide. So I am not going to re read this because Amy really uh, you know covered most of it, but I um, just wanted to highlight you know we will be discussing kind of further guidance and at the end of this presentation there's going to be some additional resources that we provide as well as some technical assistance um, opportunities. Um, next slide, and I'm going to pass it over to Janet. Thank you, Matt. Next slide. So we're just going to start off with a little bit of information about what the Violence Against Women Reauthorization Act of 2013 is. It was signed into law on March 7th, 2013, and this law implemented several key changes related to housing protections for victims of domestic violence, dating violence, sexual assault, and stalking. In particular, it expanded the applicability of existing VAWA protections to HAPWA and several other HUD programs. And it also specified sexual assault as a crime covered by VAWA in addition to domestic violence, dating violence, and stalking. Next slide. On November 16, 2016, HUD published the final rule on VAWA 2013, implementing the requirements of VAWA 2013 through HUD regulations. This VAWA final rule amended HUD's generally applicable regulations, HUD's regulations for programs that were previously covered, 
and regulations of programs that were newly covered by VAWA 2013, which includes HAPWA. Next slide. And you can find the key regulations here at 24 CFR Part 5, Subpart L, Protections for Victims of Domestic Violence, Dating Violence, Sexual Assault, or Stalking, and at 24 CFR Part 574, Housing Opportunities for Persons with AIDS. Next slide. The core statutory protections of VAWA prohibiting denial or termination of assistance or eviction because an applicant or tenant is a victim of domestic violence, dating violence, sexual assault, or stalking applied upon the enactment of VAWA 2013 on March 7, 2013. For HAPWA formula grants, compliance with VAWA's regulatory requirements is required for any project with a HAPWA funding commitment date made on or after December 16, 2016. For HAPWA competitive grants, compliance with VAWA regulatory requirements is required for awards made on or after December 16, 2016. And HAPWA grantees had 180 days from December 16, 2016 to develop emergency transfer plans. Emergency transfer provisions became effective on June 14th, 2017. Next slide. And just a word about VAWA 2022. On March 15th, 2022, the Violence Against Women Act was reauthorized and includes new requirements that HUD will implement and enforce. HUD is engaging in rulemaking and issuing regulations as appropriate to fully implement the compliance review mandate of VAWA 2022. And we do plan on hosting a webinar for VAWA 2022 implementation in the future. But if you would like more information, the link to the website is on this slide. And that will take you to a HUD site which posts all of the most recent letters and updates related to the um, rulemaking and guidance related to VAWA 2022. On that page, you can also find links to the most current forms, some of which we're going to be discussing today. Next slide. One item we did want to go over with you, however, was the updated definition of domestic violence. Uh, the, the definition of domestic violence is included in VAWA 2013, which we're covering today, but in VAWA 2022, there were a couple of updates, and those are in the highlighted sections of this definition, but I'm just going to run through this with you. Domestic violence includes felony or misdemeanor crimes committed by a current former spouse or intimate partner of the victim under the family or domestic violence laws of the jurisdiction receiving grant funding. It also includes the use or attempted use of physical abuse or sexual abuse or a pattern of any other coercive behavior committed, enabled, or solicited to gain or maintain power and control over a victim, including verbal, psychological, economic, or technological abuse that may or may not constitute criminal behavior. So the two elements of the definition are all inclusive of the felony or misdemeanor crimes in your jurisdiction that you're in, but also this pattern of behavior that is with the intent of causing harm and power and control over a victim, which may include non-criminal acts, uh, but still cause harm to the victim. Next slide. Nope, next slide. Yep, there you go. Um, these acts, the criminal or non-criminal acts are committed by a person who is a current or former spouse or intimate partner of the victim or a person similarly situated to a spouse of the victim, a person who is cohabitating or has cohabitated with the victim as a spouse or intimate partner, a person who shares a child in common with the victim, or a person who commits acts against a youth or adult victim who is protected from these acts under the family or domestic violence laws of the jurisdiction. And you can read the full definition, including the expanded economic and technological abuse definitions at the link that is provided on the slide. Next slide. 
And now I'm going to turn it over to Kate, who will talk about applicability to HAPWA eligible activities. Kate? Thanks, Janice. Next slide, please. Uh, so the VAWA requirements in 24 CFR Part 5 apply to development activities, operating costs, rental assistance, both project and tenant-based, and community residents. Next slide, please. The VAWA requirements do not apply to HOPWA short-term supported housing, such as short-term rent mortgage and utility assistance, or STRMU, and emergency or short-term facilities. It also doesn't apply to permanent housing placement. And while it doesn't apply to short-term supported housing, no individual may be denied assistance, have their assistance terminated, or be removed on the basis or as a direct result of the fact that the individual is or has been a victim of domestic violence, dating violence, sexual assault, or stalking. Um, next slide, please. So do we have any questions at this point, Carolyn? Um, yes, so uh, there is one that came in and one person asking if you can clarify which housing services are relevant to VAWA. And if um, follow up to that is, are there VAWA services that apply to all housing services? Great, thanks. Yes, VAWA requirements apply to the following projects, acquisition, rehabilitation, conversion, lease and repair our facilities, new construction, operating costs, project-based and tenant-based rental assistance, PBRA, TBRA, and community residence. Um, that's all for the questions, thank you. Great, thank you. So can we go to the next slide, please? So for those activities where VAWA does apply, let's now turn our attention to the protections it affords in housing. Next slide. Survivors of violence have a wide variety of housing protections. Victims and survivors of domestic violence, dating violence, sexual assault, and stalking are protected from adverse decisions regarding housing assistance because of VAWA violence or abuse committed against them or related to VAWA violence or abuse. They're protected from the denial of admission or assistance if the household is otherwise eligible for the program and eviction and termination of assistance related to VAWA violence or abuse. Next slide, please. Victims and survivors have the right to these VAWA protections. Emergency transfers, lease bifurcation, right to report, and self-certification. You may use this form HUD 5382. And we're gonna describe these in further detail later in our presentation. Next slide, please. So who is eligible for, HOP, for VAWA protections under HOPWA? VAWA protections cover HOPWA-assisted tenants as well as applicants for HOPWA housing assistance. VAWA protections are available to people of all genders. Victims and survivors of domestic violence, dating violence, sexual assault, or stalking are eligible for protections regardless of sex, gender identity, sexual orientation, race, color, national origin, religion, familial status, disability, or age. Next slide, please. VAWA 2013 required HUD to create a notice of VAWA rights. The VAWA final rule included a VAWA notice of occupancy rights, which can be found in HUD form 5380. The notice of occupancy rights is for use by all HUD covered programs, including HOPWA. Next slide, please. Um, HOPWA grantees are responsible for ensuring that each project sponsor carrying out HOPWA housing activities, excluding STRMU, short-term um, emergency and short-term facilities, and emergency or hotel or motel vouchers. Um, HOPWA grantees are responsible for ensuring that um, each project sponsor carrying out HOPWA housing activities provides the VAWA notice of occupancy rights at the following times. One, at the time a person is denied rental assistance or admission to a HOPWA assisted unit. Two, at the time a person is admitted to a HOPWA assisted unit or is provided rental assistance. And three, 
with any notification of eviction from the HOPWA assisted unit for notification of termination of rental assistance. Next slide, please. Um, VAWA 2013 required HUD to create a certification form to document incidents of domestic violence, dating violence, sexual assault, or stalking. The 2016 VAWA final rule included a certification form, which is the HUD 5382, for use by all HUD covered programs, including HOPWA. HOPWA grantees or project sponsors must provide form HUD 5382 to applicants and tenants with the VAWA notice of occupancy rates. HUD 5380 at the required times that I just mentioned. HUD 5382 can be used, but it is not required. This is the form that a survivor can use to document their domestic violence, sexual violence, sexual assault, dating violence, or stalking. A protective order or other documentation will suffice if verification is needed. And we're gonna discuss this further in, later in the webinar. However, survivor confidentiality and safety are paramount. Next slide, please. Um, the uh, certification form HUD 5382 is an optional way for victims to comply with a written request for documentation. The victim or someone filling out the form on the victim's behalf answers 10 numbered questions and provides a brief description of the incident or incidents. They clarify the name of the accused perpetrator. Um, I'm sorry, they need to clarify that the name of the accused perpetrator does not have to be provided if it is unknown to the victim or if it cannot be provided safely. They clarify that the date and the time of the incident be completed only if it's known by the victim. And the victim or someone filling out the form on the victim's behalf certifies to the truth and accuracy of the information being provided on the form. Next slide, please. So an applicant for HOPWA assistance or a HOPWA assisted tenant may not be denied admission to, denied assistance under, terminated from participation in, or evicted from the housing on the basis or direct result of being a victim of domestic violence, dating violence, sexual assault, or stalking. Regarding termination on the basis of criminal activity, a HOPWA assisted tenant may not be denied tenancy or occupancy rights solely due to the criminal activity related to one of the four crimes if the criminal activity is committed by a member of the tenant's household or any guest or other person under the control of the tenant and the tenant or an unaffiliated individual of the tenant is the victim or the threatened victim. Next slide, please. So how do you construct a lease? in terms of assistance. An applicant for HOPWA assistance or a HOPWA assisted tenant may not be denied admission to, denied assistance under, terminated from, I apologize. <laughs> I apologize. Um, an incident of actual or threatened domestic violence, dating violence, sexual assault, or stalking shall not be construed as a serious or repeated lease violation or good cause for terminating assistance, tenancy, or occupancy rights of the victim or threatened victim of such incident. I'm now gonna turn it over to Jill to provide further information. Thanks, Kate. Let's go to the next slide, please. And let's begin our conversation around the emergency transfer plans. So grantees must develop, adopt, administer an emergency transfer plan that is modeled after HUD emergency transfer plans. Um, it doesn't have to be the exact HUD 5381, the sample, but it does have to include the components of 24 CFR 5, Part 2005E. Grantees should consider how their project sponsors will actually operationalize the plan. What is the time frame that will occur from the beginning step to the next step? You will want to talk with your community to make sure the plan makes sense and also that safety is considered. Next slide, please. So each HOPWA grantee emergency transfer plan must include uh, the identification of the tenants who are eligible for a transfer. Um, all the, Kate identified those uh, specifics around 
survivors of domestic violence, sexual assault, sexual violence, dating violence, stalking, and how that transfer would occur. So you do have to go into a fair amount of details. Um, you will have to identify what documentation will be needed to make the emergency transfer request. Does that request have to be in writing? It doesn't have to be according to the regulations. Can the survivor simply sign a form stating that they were a victim of violence? Yes, that could be an option. What exactly is needed? You will want to make sure your emergency transfer plan is spelled out in as much detail as you're able to do. The measure of priority for the units for those that are seeking the emergency transfer plans should be spelled out as well in your plan. Uh, that can be difficult to do, but you'll want to discuss a little bit about internal and external transfers. We'll talk more about that here shortly. And then lastly, you want to make sure that uh, there is a that it's plain and simple how confidentiality protections will be provided, uh, what the guidance is to the tenants in terms of their own safety and security. You'll want to make sure you include those items in your plan. Next slide, please. So the emergency transfer plan must allow victims of domestic violence, sexual violence, sexual assault, dating violence, or stalking to request a transfer if they believe there is imminent harm that could occur in their unit. For sexual assault survivors, the qualifications are slightly different. A sexual assault survivor can qualify to request this emergency transfer if they believe there is a threat to imminent harm from further violence. This could look a little bit different than it might for some other survivors, specifically for sexual assault. If the tenant is concerned about further violence by remaining in the same unit or the assault occurred on the premises within the last night or within 90 days of the request, uh, this would allow them to make a request to have an emergency transfer plan or have an emergency transfer. They do not have to meet both qualifications. It can be a threat of imminent harm or they had the uh, something occurred on the premise within the last 90 days. It's either or. Next slide, please. The, the emergency transfer plans must indicate how the HOPWA assisted tenants can request an emergency transfer. The verbal self-certification is sufficient or grantees may require a written request for an emergency transfer. Either must include a statement verbally or in writing that the tenant is requesting an emergency transfer because the tenant reasonably believes that there is a threat of imminent harm from for, for further violence. And then second, a statement that the tenant requests an emergency transfer because the tenant has been a survivor of sexual assault and they're concerned that uh, there is imminent danger or that the occurrence occurred within the last 90 days. So again, the either or um, verbal self-certification is sufficient. I um, just want to make sure that we highlight that. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Great. Uh, let's talk a little bit about some definitions, uh, the internal emergency transfers and the external emergency transfers. So the internal emergency transfer could be a transfer from one unit to another unit within the organization or within your HOPWA program. That may or may not work for a particular survivor. So having an external emergency transfer option is really a good plan. Uh, that would be to go to another provider or possibly a new HUD program, uh, possibly to another geographic location, the external emergency transfers can look very different than your internal emergency transfers. You'll want to be sure to define what these terms mean in your plan and keep in mind or spell out as much as you can uh, how this should be operationalized. It's great to say you're going to have emer external emergency transfers, 
But survivors are going to want to know what does that mean? How will they stay safe? How long is this going to take? And what are the steps moving forward? So be sure you define that in your plan. Next slide, please. Let's talk a little bit more about the internal emergency transfers. So just want to highlight a few things here. So a safe unit is always defined by the survivor. Uh, that's the most important takeaway from this particular slide. What will your policy be for making sure that the tenants remain safe while they're waiting for a unit, even if it's within your own program, uh, within your own physical jurisdiction, you'll want to describe exactly what this looks like as much as you can within your own policies. And then also you'll want to spell out specifically in your plan um, how those that are seeking the emergency transfers will be prioritized. Will their crisis move them up to the top of the list or are there some other uh, extenuating circumstances that would not make them first in line, but maybe second? Uh, so you wanna make sure that you spell that out in your plan. Next slide, please. Let's talk a little bit more about the external transfers. Again, you'll want to spell out in your plan how you will assist the tenant who needs to move outside of your HOPWL program. Or maybe you're working with another HOPWL provider across town, across the state, um, in another state. That's certainly something that can be uh, defined in your plan. Again, the, the takeaway here is gonna be that what Whatever the survivor de defines as a safe unit, you really have to go with that. We might think a unit is safe, but if a survivor says no, it isn't, then you have to go with that. It really could mean life and death for that survivor. So make it clear the timelines for your external emergency transfers. Uh, get that in your plan. Um, your plan should include how to ensure that survivors are kept safe um, and how they're going to be kept safe while they're waiting. Because the, these external transfers can take a fair amount of time and resources to really uh, fulfill. And when your plans are operationalized in the community, you will want to make sure that you communicate this to your domestic violence programs, to the coalitions, uh, to others that might be serving survivors, so they know exactly what the options will be or whether they would be called upon to provide some additional support. Next slide, please. All right, let's talk now about record keeping and recording. So all HOPWA grantees and project sponsors need to keep records on their emergency transfer requests. So anytime um, a survivor asks for an emergency transfer, you'll want to make sure that you have a way of keeping track of that. Those records do need to be retained for four years. Um, there could be opportunities down the road where you would need to review that data, but for sure, um, HUD will need to collect this data on the, re the requests that you've received, and then the outcomes will need to be submitted annually with your CAPER or APR. Next slide, please. So how will you be reporting this? Um, you'll be reporting it in your APR or your CAPER. And so this would be for both grantees and project sponsors will be collecting this data. You may be wondering what exactly are the questions, what will need to be collected. So we've listed the questions for you here. How many internal emergency transfers were requested? How many internal emergency transfers were granted? Then how many external emergency transfers were requested? how many external emergency transfers were granted, and then finally, how many emergency transfers were denied. Really, I just can't stress enough how important it is to have good record keeping um, and be, to be sure to report your uh, information to HUD in a timely way. Congress is anxious to see um, how we're doing on uh, the VAWA implementation, so uh, we really appreciate your help in the record keeping. Next slide, please. Okay, let's turn our attention to the lease addendum. Um, I know sometimes people have questions about this. 
Um, I did want to just mention that if you look on the HUD exchange or you Google um, lease, HUD lease addendums for HOPLA, most likely you're going to find HUD form 91067. That will typically come up. I want to make sure that everyone knows this really only reflects the vowel requirements from 2005. So today we're talking about 2013. So that lease addendum is really very outdated. I encourage you not to use that. Uh, we will make available a sample uh, that we have, um, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so leases do now need to include the VAWA addendum, the VAWA language. This should already be in place so that your, that your HOPWA tenants know their specific rights. We do recognize that some landlords might not want to sign the lease addendums um, or now the leases that include the VAWA requirements, they may not want to sign that. But in many states and cities, there are more serious requirements for VAWA that landlords would have to adhere to as, as far as taking any kind of federal funding. Um, so uh, we will offer, also offer some additional trainings uh, around landlord engagement as we talk further about VAWA 2022. Next slide, please. So a little bit more on the VAWA lease addendums. So the VAWA lease addendum must provide that the tenant may terminate the lease without penalty if the tenant has met the conditions for the emergency transfer. That's why it's so important for you to get in writing exactly what's required, whether that be a verbal or a written um, statement requesting the transfer. Additionally, the addendum has to incorporate these parts of 24 CFR part five, subpart L, including the definition has to be spelled out. Uh, you, you need to cover the prohibited basis for denial or termination of assistance or eviction. Uh, that's covered again in the 24 CFR 5.2005B. Also, you'll wanna cover the construction of lease terms and the terms of assistance the limitations of VAWA protections, and then you'll also want to make sure to cover the confidentiality requirements. Again, these are all part of your lease addendum. Uh, the tenant really needs to know that they will not be penalized if they make a request for an emergency transfer. Um, and I did mention in the previous slide, but we do have a sample draft uh, that we'll share in the chat. I do want to make sure to emphasize this is a sample. It is not an official HUD form, uh, but it may provide you um, some useful language if you want to craft your own um, or you want to use something similar on the local level. Next slide, please. All right, so um, the one of the things that we want to make sure to let you know is that FHEO, so that's the Fair Housing Off and, and the the Fair Housing Office here at HUD, is the enforcement arm of VAWA. Uh, they also do, of course, other fair housing and civil rights laws and um, enforcement of those laws and regulations. Um, we do have a link here on the slides that you'll receive that allows you to go to uh, learn a little bit more about uh, the VAWA regulations, um, the memo that came out March 27th, 2023, which was a memorandum of guidance on the implementation of the FHEO notice. Uh, so we'll make that available. Uh, we wanted to just make sure that everyone knew that tenants can file a complaint if they feel that their rights have been violated. We have the link available for you on the slide. Um, again, FHEO is the enforcement arm of VAWA regulations. Next slide, please. Okay, let's pause for a minute and see if we have any questions. Yes, yeah, so um, just to wrap the presentation, a couple have come in. So okay. the first one, is there an error that the emergency transfer plan must be defined by the grantee rather than the project sponsor? Yeah, that's a great question. So per the HOPL regulations, the grantee is actually responsible for the development of the emergency transfer plan and the project sponsor is responsible for adapting it, administering and implementing the plan. Uh, 
Uh, the plan can be developed and should be developed collaboratively between the grantee and project sponsor, but ultimately the grantee is the one that is responsible for ensuring that it's one, developed, and then two, it complies with the regulations. Great, any other questions? Um, yes, just one more. Um, okay, so this question is, is, is there any language in regulation indicating expectation of a, of a due diligence for survivor status through third party? And a follow-up question to that is, or can self-certification always be accepted as supported in the regulations? Okay, great, great question. So self-certification can always be accepted as documentation. Uh, grantees and project sponsors are actually prohibited from requiring third party or a specific form of certification. Now there is one exception. So third party documentation can be required uh, when, there, when one applicant or a tenant provides documentation of victim status and that information in one person's documentation conflicts with another person's documentation, that would be one exception. Or another exception would be if the submitted documentation contains information that conflicts with existing information that is already available to either the grantee or project sponsor. In these instances, applicants may choose from the list of acceptable third-party documentation to support their application. Great question. Okay, thank you. Um, that's it for now. Okay, great. I'm going to um, turn the mic over to Matt. Thank you. Thanks, Jill. Um, we are, I'm going to go over a little bit of the uh, documentation requirements. Uh, next slide. So if an applicant uh, for HOPO assistance or HOPO assisted tenant seeks VAWA protections, the individual must submit the request through the grantee or project sponsor to facilitate protections on their behalf. Grantees, project sponsors are not required to ask for documentation when, when an individual requests VAWA protections. Protections may be provided based solely on an individual's verbal statement or other corroborating evidence. If the grantee or project sponsor chooses to request an applicant or tenant to document the claim of domestic violence, dating violence, sexual assault, or stalking, the grantee or project sponsor must make the request in writing. If a written request for documentation is made, uh, grantees, project sponsors may require that the documentation be submitted within 14 days after the date the individual received the request. Um, and I just wanted to kind of reiterate, um, and Jill covered this previously, but the survivor, not the provider, gets to decide what form of documentation to use. If a survivor chooses to use the self-cert form, then that has to be sufficient Providers cannot ask for additional documentation unless there's conflicting info. Next slide. Any one of the following documents may be submitted to satisfy a request for documentation. Um, we discussed Form HUD 5382. Uh, a document, uh, another form could be a document that includes all of the following, uh, which is signed by an employee, agent, or volunteer of a victim service provider, an attorney, or medical mental health professional from whom the victim has sought assistance relating to domestic violence, dating violence, sexual assault, or stalking, or the effects of abuse. Um, it can be signed by the applicant or tenant. The professional specifies under penalty of perjury, they believe the occur occurrence of the incident that is ground for protection and remedies under the VAWA final rule and the incident meets the applicable definitions of domestic violence, dating violence, sexual assault, or stalking under 24 CFR 5.2003. A record of a, another form of documentation is a record of a federal state tribal, territorial, local law enforcement agency, which may include a police report, um, a court or an administrative agency, and lastly, at the discretion of the grantee or project sponsor, a statement or other evidence provided by the applicant or tenant. Next slide. 
Grantees project sponsored are prohibited from requiring the victim to provide third party documentation of victim status um, unless more than one applicant or tenant provides documentation of victim, victim status and the information in one person's documentation conflicts with the information in, in another person's documentation or submitted uh, documentation contains information that conflicts with existing information already available to the grantee or project sponsor. Next slide. Third party documentation. Um, in situations of conflicting information, an applicant or tenant may submit any of the following to meet a third party documentation request. Um, this could include a document that includes all of the following. Um, and this goes back to having something that's signed by an employee, agent, or volunteer of a victim service provider, an attorney, or medical mental health professional from whom the victim has sought assistance relating to domestic violence, dating violence, sexual assault, or stalking, or the effects of abuse. Uh, again, it could be signed by the applicant or tenant. Um, and just reiterate that the professional specifies under penalty of perjury, they believe the occurrence of the incident that is ground for protection and remedies under the VAWA final rule, and the incident meets the applicable definitions of domestic violence, dating violence, sexual assault, or stalking under 24 CFR 5.2003. Um, and again, a record of a federal, state, tribal, territorial, or local law enforcement agency which may include a police report, a court or an administrative agency can also be used and at the discretion of the grantee or project sponsor, a statement or other evidence uh, provided by the applicant or tenant. Next slide. Any information, um, and, and this just relates to confidentiality, we wanna make sure we're protecting the victim, any information submitted to a HOPA grantee, project sponsor or housing, owner or manager, including the fact that the individual is a victim must be maintained in confidence. Employees of the grantee, project sponsor, or housing owner or manager, or those who administer assistance on their behalf, example, contractors, must not have access to the information unless specifically authorized for reasons that are specifically called for these individuals to have access to such information under applicable federal, state, or local law. And next slide, the grantee project sponsor or housing um, owner or manager must not enter this information into any shared database or to close, disclose this information to any other entity or individual except to the extent that disclosure is requested or consented to in writing by the individual that, which is the victim in a time limited release required for use in an eviction proceeding or hearing regarding termination of assistance or otherwise required by applicable law. And we're just gonna, uh, next slide, um, pause here to see if there's any other additional questions. Yes, um, and actually a couple more. Um, the first is, can you please note which of all these forms are required versus optional, uh, for example, must use versus use. Thank you. Um, so the required forms are uh, number one, the VAWA addendum, um, number two, the occupancy rights uh, form, number three, the emergency transfer plan. Optional forms are emergency transfer requests as you are allowed to accept a verbal request, uh, self-certification form, uh, survivors may choose from the menu of options allowed to document victim, victim, victimization. Uh, the self-certificate form is just one possible form they may submit. Okay, thank you. Um, and the next question is, do we have to use HUD's forms or can we use our own? They are generally identical to HUD's but include more detail. Um, you can't, HUD does not require use of the model forms. However, uh, grantees or project sponsors creating their own forms must ensure that all required elements are included in the forms, that's number one. And number two, that those forms are not requiring a higher level of specificity in documentation or process than HUD allows. Uh, just for example, it can be required that a survivor submit a specific form of documentation or more than one form of documentation. Okay, 
All right, that's that's all for now on questions. Okay, sounds great. Thanks. Um, and I'm going to pass it over to Jana. Thanks, Matt. We're going to talk about lease bifurcation, which is one of the protections under VAWA 2013. Um, a HOPWA grantee, project sponsor, or housing owner or manager may bifurcate a lease or remove a household member from a lease in order to evict, remove, terminate occupancy rights, or terminate assistance to a member who engages in criminal activity directly relating to one of the four VAWA abuses or violence. When the option is exercised to bifurcate a lease, to evict, remove, terminate occupancy rights, or terminate assistance to a HAPWA eligible household member, the remaining persons residing in the unit must be provided a reasonable grace period to establish eligibility to continue receiving HAPWA assistance or find alternative housing. And I just want to remind everyone that the person who's being removed is the person who is causing harm or engaging in the criminal activity, not the person who is being harmed or is um, is the victim in the situation. Next slide. The grantee or project sponsor is responsible for setting the reasonable grace period and notifying the remaining members of its duration, which shall be no less than 90 calendar days and not more than one year from the date of the bifurcation of the lease. Housing assistance and supportive services continue to be provided to the remaining members during the grace period. Next slide. And I just wanna go over a few additional points of guidance and some resources for you as you navigate these requirements. First, we want you to understand that it's important for everyone who is working in, in the project to be able to recognize and respond supportively when a survivor discloses domestic violence, dating violence, sexual assault, or stalking. The link in the slide is to um, a resource that might be able to help folks identify persons impacted by domestic violence and sexual assault. Um, but really we're not asking property managers, project sponsors, um, any of the staff working in the projects to be experts at this. The really what we want is for folks to be able to identify and provide appropriate referrals for supportive victim or legal services. So recognize that the abuse is happening, express appropriate concern, and make that connection to the services that that survivor needs. One way to be able to help recognize this is to ensure that the lease addendum is used um, every single time that you're doing a lease. When that is the case, it's giving a signal to the person who's experiencing victimization that it's okay to talk about the abuse. It's okay to come forward and ask for assistance. So as you're recognizing when these VAWA housing protections might be available to the client, you want to be able to ensure that staff are able to assist survivors in making requests related to VAWA housing protections, which is why there's a minimal threshold that a survivor must reach in order to request something. There's not a lot of complicated forms and self-certification is considered the best practice. Uh, when you ensure that the VAWA lease addendum is used, it facilitates these protections for the tenants, but it also helps to ensure that the property manager, the project sponsor, and all of the staff are also safe because they're you don't have tenants who are afraid to come forward and enduring additional violence or having violent individuals in that in the um, project because they are afraid to come forward because they're afraid they'll lose their tenancy. Again, a reminder that form HUD 5382 is the VAWA self-certification form that can be used by a survivor. It's not required. And we are aware that the forms do have expiration dates on them, but the guidance from HUD is to continue to use the forms until they're updated. Next slide. As you're educating clients on VAWA housing protections, you want to be sure to emphasize that they are protected from denial of assistance, termination, or eviction related to the abuse. So being a victim cannot cause you to be denied assistance, to have your lease terminated, or for you to be evicted from the project. 
You want to assure victims that they have a right to the confidentiality of records and in shared databases. You will not share this information with the person who has caused them harm, nor with just anybody who comes into the office or is working there. You want to assure victims that they have a right to an emergency transfer um, or a lease bifurcation, that they have the right to self-report the abuse, and they have a right to file a fair housing complaint should they need to. Again, grantees must have an emergency transfer plan. Project sponsors can create their own agency VAWA policies based on the grantee policies, but there should be that parent plan in place. HUD 5381 is an emergency transfer policy template that can be customized. And HUD 5383 is an emergency transfer request template that can be customized. Next slide. Again, project sponsors must provide the notice of occupancy rights to all clients, that's HUD 5380, at the following times. One, when a person is denied rental assistance or admission to a HAPWA assisted unit. Two, at the time a person is admitted to a HAPWA assisted unit or is provided with rental assistance. And three, with any notification of eviction from a HAPWA assisted unit or notification of termination of rental assistance. If state regulations provide more protections than VAWA 2013, then grantees must comply with the state regulations. Next slide. Again, please use the current forms, even if they're expired. Uh, HUD will be updating those forms and then they'll swap out. Grantees and project sponsors should collect and report the data related to emergency transfer in their APR caper as required. And as a reminder, that is the number of internal emergency transfers that were requested and granted, and the number of external emergency transfers that were requested and granted, and how many emergency transfers were denied. Those are the five questions related to that data collection. Next slide. And here are just some links that will be made available to you when you receive the slides. Uh, the first is to HUD's final rule, VAWA 2013, if you'd like to read the Federal Register. The second is additional HUD Violence Against Women Act information and resources. This includes your frequently asked questions, links to the forms, national hotlines, resources for survivors, uh, and those are updated uh, as new information comes out. And then finally, you can always submit a question to HOPWA's Ask a Question on the HUD Exchange. Next slide. We do want to remind everyone that we have an upcoming webinar on HOPWA federal requirements versus HOPWA local requirements, dispelling the myths. That will be happening on Wednesday, August 23rd, 2023 at 3 p.m. Eastern time. Next slide. And help is available to you. If you would like technical assistance or to ask a question, you can reach out through HUD Exchange. Uh, technical assistance is available to support grantees with HOPWA COVID-19 planning, program development, problem solving. Um, and if you have a question about how policy or regulation is applied, you can submit that to HOPWA Ask a Question Portal. Next slide. And we'll, that, that is the end of our webinar. We will just stop for any additional questions. Um, yes, when it's when someone is filing on behalf of someone else, how can you verify? And does that person need to be an eyewitness or can it be based on what they were told? Uh, it's a great question. Uh, in the case of third party certification, a document submitted must be signed by an employee, agent, or volunteer of a victim service provider, by an attorney, by a medical or mental health professional. Um, this, and that person must be somebody that the victim has sought assistance related to domestic violence, dating violence, sexual assault, or stalking uh, for the effects of the abuse. This document has to be signed by the applicant or tenant, and it also has to be signed by the professional, one of the categories that I just listed. 
Um, and they professional then has to certify under penalty of perjury that they believe the occurrence of the incident is grounds for protections and remedies under the VAWA final rule. They have to um, certify that this incident meets the applicable definition of domestic violence, dating violence, sexual assault, or stalking under 24 CFR 5.2003. Okay, thank you. A couple more. This one is for Jill. Um, as for the VAWA, as per the VAWA requirements for COPLA, a VAWA lease term addendum must be added to the leases for all eligible persons receiving COPLA tenant based rental assistance. If landlords do not comply with this, are we no longer able to continue to assist clients already receiving TVRA? And they're not able to assist new clients whose landlords do not comply with this requirement? And this has, uh, so to speak louder. Um, let's see. This has the potential of displacing current TVRA clients in which they will no longer have a place to live and prevents clients who need TVRA from getting it because we cannot force landlords to comply and it is out of their control whether they do or don't. This is especially concerning with the current housing market. Now that the addendum at the difficulty of just being able to find assistance rental units that are within the rent standard limits in the first place, as well as meeting all the COPWA HQS habitability standards, including the newly added CO alarm detector requirement. Yeah, that's a lot of a question, um, but a good one. So uh, uh, the question just around landlords is a challenging one. Uh, probably most providers have some struggles with landlords. Um, so landlords still do have to um, adopt their required terms uh, within the lease templates to include VAWA. They either have to use or adopt a lease addendum in order to receive HOPWA or really pretty much any other HUD rental assistance. Uh, if a tenant is currently in the middle of their lease, and doesn't have a VAWA addendum in their lease at the moment, then once that lease is renewed, that does have to be uh, a component within that lease to, in order to be renewed and for the landlord to receive the HUD rental assistance uh, for HOPWA and other programs. Um, I did mention during the webinar, we will be doing some additional VAWA 2022 webinars and we will, or we anticipate being able to do a webinar around landlord engagement uh, because we do recognize this is a serious uh, situation and we wanna make sure that landlords understand their requirements um, as well as grantees and project sponsors. So thanks for that question. Okay, um, we have one final question. Um, so this final question, one moment is back to Janice actually. Is there information to provide landlords to help them understand VAWA requirements? And do you have any great arguments to help landlords agree to sign the addenda? Yeah, that is a great question. So I think the first thing that you wanna do is try to find out what part of the addendum is objectionable to landlords. Um, a lot of times there are local or state laws that actually cover those provisions, for example, breaking a lease, and the landlord just may not be aware of that law that's in place. And we're going to drop a link in the chat here that shows what, uh, a listing of all of the different state or local laws that are currently up to, it's up to date through 2018. Um and then I think once you've sort of addressed the question of whether or not they're already having to comply with those laws, the other thing that you can try is to remind landlords uh, that these VAWA requirements are in place not only to keep the survivors safe, but also to provide safety for property managers and other tenants in the complex. So the ability to quickly address the safety issues caused by domestic violence, dating violence, sexual assault, and stalking may prevent future criminal activity on the property. It might reduce property damage to the unit or the site and could reduce the turnover in other tenants who do not want to live somewhere where they feel unsafe. So 
it also helps to for landlords to retain an otherwise peaceful tenant who is being victimized so that they might continue to live in the unit and the person who is causing the harm and the potential damage is then leaving. Uh, and then just as a final note, I think Jill mentioned, you know, many HUD funded programs also have this requirement. So it's not just HAPWA that is requiring this VAWA lease addendum. And it may be helpful then to connect with your local COC and or host a landlord meeting to review the requirements when participating in a HUD funded program and to encourage participation or to talk about the benefits of participating in this. Okay, awesome. Thank you. So um, no more questions coming in now. So I'm set there. Well, thank you. Um, we really appreciate everybody joining us in uh, joining us today. And again, as a reminder, um, we will be posting this on the HUD Exchange here coming up shortly. Um, so stay tuned uh, and uh, have a great rest of the day. Take care. You could turn off the recording. Come on.